And you gonna murder this one and murder that one yeah. Talking all that bullshit I'ma put it to you like this, yo This is for the nerds This is for the brainiacs This is what we deserve Go ahead and play it back You ain't gonna touch me You not gonna do nothing You are not above me I bet you wish you was me I know it, I know What is poppin' everybody? And welcome back to another special episode of the Only Friends Podcast. Who you know, it's me and my only friends, which includes, but it's not limited to, my boy Hunt. <laughs> How are you today, Matthew Hunt? I'm doing well, Conrad. That was a that was a very like you sound like you're gonna be on the radio with that intro. We're very glad to have you in studio here today for Stretch Chat. This is gonna be awesome. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> How's everybody that's, else doing? That's your, you could be on British radio with that mm-hmm. voice. You really could. In the UK, we would call that a Radio 4 voice, because Radio 4 is the radio station that has all the, the people who really have that sophisticated voice going on. Wow. It's like a borderline accidental Mark Wahlberg impersonation. Like, really? Hey, how's your mother doing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just thought, your mother for me. I just thought a Mark Wahlberg impersonation <laughs> would be like a really strong Boston accent. Like, that, there, was, there was a little bit of that. Yeah. that in there. That's actually... A subtle Andy Sandberg like impersonating doing. Mark Wahlberg. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> so Conrad doing Andy Sandberg doing Mark Wahlberg <laughs> here live for now, you all. We need someone to do we Conrad the doing best. Andy Sandberg right. doing what we need. Well, we just did. We had the tortoise do it. Oh yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're adding levels. We're adding layers to this shit. Oh, That's right. We're 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 coming from downtown. Uh, this stretch chat. I, I'm I'm happy to have you here today, Hunt, because mm-hmm. all I wanted to talk about yesterday was WrestleMania, and all oh, we yeah? ended up talking about was uh, women in poker. <laughs> yeah, I, well, it's a, two very contrasting topics. Yeah, you know, both not, of which not... I think you're you're uh, uh, not an authority on, but like uh, somebody who could reasonably carry a conversation. Well, I have, on both. I have, I have uh, much more to say when it comes to evaluating WrestleMania than I sure. do when it comes to meaningful opinions on women in poker. Like, I'm not the guy to listen to on that, but I'm definitely the guy to listen to about WrestleMania. Uh, so I didn't ca- if I. If I had known I could watch it for free when yeah. I when I was growing up, mm-hmm. I'll tell you the last time I watched WrestleMania. It was it was uh, two thousand. So what month are we in? March. Mm-hmm. It's always in the spring, right? Yeah, March, April. Okay, yeah. yeah so spring of two thousand. Chad Rice. I was about to say we were at Chad Rice's house. Chad Rice sure. ordered it. Uh, mm-hmm. Pay per view. Um, it was the night Owen Hart died. Oh shit! Well, that wasn't WrestleMania. That was a different event. Oh. Was yeah, it? That was uh, SummerSlam? No. King of the Ring, King, I think. King of the Ring, maybe. 1998 yeah. Okay. Whatever it was, it was Something a pay per view like event. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That was the last pay per view I watched. Uh, I remember there being a large delay because Owen fell from the rafters. Yeah. They fucking wrestled through his blood. It like blood soaked ring. One of, of it all was the sick. Absolutely fucked up things Vince McMahon has done. That's one of the worst. Like, Has to be. A guy dies and everyone's like, oh, you got to just carry on with the show. And they, like, you know, the audience witnessed. The whole thing yeah, happened. Like the super traumatic thing of a guy literally dying in front of a thousand people, thousands of people, and they just like carry on. You what? know, like it's it's insane, what? absolutely insane. Okay. Have you never heard the phrase "the show must go on"? I have, but I think there's an exception <laughs> for when caveats. someone literally dies. No, like, I, <laughs> the show must go on at all costs. Not in America, baby. What? Well, I mean, what? guys, guys, guys. The Bills, you know, they made up for it. The guy got a concussion. He almost looked like he was going to pass away. And he was dead for game. a little bit, yeah. I think. The NFL made up for it. DeMar yeah, they, they canceled, okay. it, canceled yeah, the game. It was not a concussion, I don't think. No, it was, um, it was a heart thing. A heart thing, yeah. It was heart stopped. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, it was a concussion. Same, same. It was a concussion of the heart. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. what, same. What Landon was going to ask is what happened to Owen Hart. I could see it all over his face. Someone What happened to Owen Hart? He was doing an entrance where he was descending in a harness from the rafters he was being like lifted down into the ring and his harness broke and he he fell and landed on the the ring post post, the turnbuckle of the ring i had heard that he wasn't even harnessed in uh i i don't know i don't i've never been able to watch the footage so i don't know specifically but basically he fell from a it's out there it's out there the footage i was gonna say it has to be it's out there but i've never never watched it it. like he he dropped from a great height onto a ring post uh Basically, just I, I don't know what happened. It, like it just collapsed his chest or it, something. It was and he fifty just, feet. Just died. Fell fell on the turnbuckle. Allegedly, they massaged his heart in the middle of the ring. Uh, he passed away before he made it to the hospital. So the whole ring is blood soaked. I'm sorry. What? 
<laughs> Nobody else is hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but we are. <laughs> so I know every time you every work in here, what it do you sounds want? Sounds like Japanese was. porn to me. <laughs> it's funny exactly that exactly what I thought it sounded something, like. When something random or like foreign like goes into our uh, our headsets, like we always like bring light to it <laughs> when, when we, well, you it's can't just help audience it. could not hear it. But, but you, you just can't have, help you it. You just have to ignore it. You can't we help hear it the weirdest fucking sounds. Right. It's never something normal. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's never just it like, like <laughs> what the f- he's, he's never Googling like, you know, uh, the, the great googly moogly commercial or anything like that. It's, it's always this like weird uh, dark web shit. Oh, stop. It's <laughs> not that bad. I mean, you know, we we found out, you know, he is kind of well, famous for this, you know, letting his um his browser go a little bit. <laughs> My sometimes. browser history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's I did want to say it was a pay per view called Raw is War. That's oh, not wow. a pay per view. That, that yeah, was, that's that's that the prelim their, to the pay per view. That was what the name of Monday Night Raw used to be. Right. So that was their weekly show on a Monday. It was it was I am which apparently like Netflix bought. Sure it was a. They did. I think WWE I think, Raw is going to be on Netflix from January, I believe, next year. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not positive kind of the Owen Hart thing, but I feel like it was SummerSlam, um, just because I remember it being warm outside. And it, we, it was we, in May. Ye, okay, I, that would I be am SummerSlam. Like, I'm like 80% sure it was King of the Ring 1998. I'm yeah, not, could not be 100%, that. but... I just know it was nice outside because uh, we went outside and smashed Pat, Ma- uh, Pat Macklin's head into a steel <laughs> garbage. Pat, Pat McAfee. McAfee. <laughs> yeah, I did almost say Pat McAfee. Speaking of which... Speaking <laughs> which of which, we could have. He was only like 14 at the time. Your, your boy McAfee was on commentary for WrestleMania. Yeah. He was really fucking He's funny. He's incredible. He's so good. Even my wife, who... We, my wife likes wrestling as well, but she doesn't like a lot of WWE stuff. She like... She isn't really usually that interested. I had yeah. WrestleMania on... She was like, wow, this, this guy's really funny. This, like, she, she liked McAfee, and she there was like, go. he's really adding something to this on commentary. So my wife is a McAfee fan now, thanks to WrestleMania. That's good to hear. Um, he, he talks about this all the time, and I never really gave it much credibility because I stopped watching wrestling years mm-hmm. ago. But he'll like cut promos during his show. And when you're watching, you just assume mm-hmm. that you know it's like, ad lib but also probably yeah. something that was like prep no this guy is just like so good yeah he just like snaps into whatever character it is that he needs to play mm-hmm. uh i saw i saw a highlight of of uh this past wrestlemania i think it was for the main event um when like undertaker came in yeah. and john cena came in and there was a <laughs> there was a point where i think cena like cleared off the the, com- the commentary the table when they do yeah. when they're like okay we're about to throw a guy through the table right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. you know the the it, honestly it really is like watching a male soap opera like it's so That's predictable exactly it is, everything's yeah. telegraphed but he dropped a one liner in there that I don't remember off the top of my head and he said it like so nonchalantly mm-hmm. and not with a tone of seriousness but like with a tone of no shock whatsoever yeah. And I just died. Yeah. I was like, that's so subtle, but He's man, great. he just and absolutely You know what it. was even funnier is they had a match where uh, I don't remember why. Well, okay, so backstory is they have so much like sponsorship now, right? Yeah. Every, every match is like, this match is sponsored by this. Yeah, C4, of, yeah. Prime. Oh, I saw the Prime bottle. Right. That was and, ridiculous. And one, one of the matches was sponsored by the some new drink that is a, like made, the company is like Snoop Dogg's company makes a drink okay so they got snoop dogg on commentary right for this match of and he's done a bunch of stuff with wrestling before he's like he has fun with it but it was snoop and pat mcafee and michael cole the other commentator yeah. on commentary and mcafee was just cracking weed jokes like the whole time <laughs> and it was really really funny the he, match does was this like on, he does this on a show bullshit. too like yeah. he's a stoner yeah, he's, of course. he's like an admitted stoner and he does this on a show on espn mm-hmm. all the time yeah um, it was uh, it was over the edge mm. in 1999. Over the edge, of course, yeah, 1999. Which I feel like it was maybe a one-off. Um, yeah, that, as far it's as not like a regular go. event. Right, they have, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Owen wasn't even Owen Hart in that one. He was the blue blue yeah, blazer, blue blazer or, something. or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, 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 what a way to go out. You hate to see it. <laughs> your your alternate character. Yeah, you're you're going out like in a fucking <laughs> luchador costume, like right. a, like dressed up like a Mexican wrestler guy. Like yeah, yeah, you're not even allowed to die in your own character. <laughs> yeah, man, WWE brutal. Uh, but the hype was real. I, I and I guess like coming full circle, it's like now it's free on Peacock. Mm-hmm. So I guess they partnered with Peacock for. They they used to have a thing. They used to have a WWE Network, which was right, like their right, own yeah. app. Yeah, and they still have that outside the US, I believe. 
but now everything that they do in the US is on Peacock. They just like they partnered with NBC to to just have all their shit on Peacock. Mm-hmm. So if you have Peacock, you can watch all their main like pay-per-views and I think they get episodes of Raw and SmackDown like a couple weeks after they air. Right. Um, and that makes sense, right? Like they own USA Network also. Yeah. yeah. Peacock does. Okay, and, so that makes sense. Right. So they've they, been on USA. They still we just got a fact check. I'm sorry. Go on. Do it to our good friend Corgasm. Yeah. Who is yelling at me in the chat to Google it. He did it for me and it was over the edge. He just said I that. hate you so much. He literally just said he that 30 did, seconds yeah. ago. What is wrong with you, man? <laughs> you have headphones on. Like, it'd be funny if this were a bit, but Wait, it's not. I, I think it might I be a bit this time. I can't no, believe, I mean, here is it. I can't believe I mean, here is he stopped it. the show and I knew what was happening. It was like watching a train crash. <laughs> the amount I mean, of positive it. versus negative CSAs has been like 0 to 24. Shut your face. It's just so insane that he confidently <laughs> says it's Raw is War, which anybody who's ever watched wrestling just knows that it's not. <laughs> then <laughs> someone in the chat does the work for him 10 minutes after the host is in his lap fucking Googling Why it. Is yeah. These uh, headphones are so psychic. loud today. Oh my god. For gosh. what it's worth, Conrad, I do it all the time, but not, not on out the show. loud. <laughs> <laughs> not on the show, because like when I'm off the air, I'm just in my own world. But on the show, I try to I, listen I was to what fun, people are saying. I was making yeah. fun of you for doing it on the boat. <laughs> it's incredible. It's like Conrad exactly. <laughs> Conrad is uh our our less aware Jesse Sylvia. If that's <laughs> somehow possible. <laughs> what I, I'm the co-host. I'm the sidekick. Side You're sidekick, yeah. yes. Christ mm-hmm. almighty, man. You're the official sidekick. Wait, what was it called? Over the edge? <laughs> oh, yeah. Over yes. the edge. Over the top if you Which want to bring it to the You're going to throw, throw Connor over the edge. Over the edge is kind of like a... Sent me over the edge a long fucking time ago, buddy. You've been off the edge. i got to say also, it's kind of an unfortunate name for an event where a guy, guy fell, fell yeah. to his death. Yeah. yeah. That's like, fucked up. Specifically, he dies by falling off of something. Yeah. Like, that is... That's we're, unfortunate. We're living in a simulation, man. We really are, yeah. Man, that kind of sucks. Like They probably checked that harness so many times and then just like well, the, the story was in game the story about vince mcmahon like has always been that every time someone is going to do something dangerous for something like that vince mcmahon always tests it himself first so i don't know <laughs> i call I, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that's what that's what people have said and people not not vince himself people other right. than vince have said that that yeah. he's willing to do this stuff i don't know though because how do you test it and then it still fucks up like it, it, someone's someone's done something irresponsible somewhere right like if a guy ends up dying from the fact that the harness broke or whatever like something's gone wrong was there any insurance policies on his life who the hell knows i don't know but <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I i have no idea but i just know that there's a, a bunch of people that were like backstage performing and they were like yeah he died but you got to go out and do your match now i'm curious Jeez. if he it's was like, married uh yeah yeah he was he was yeah. Interesting. AEW, <laughs> the, the, the other me? the other rival promotion to WWE now, AEW has a, a tournament that they do every year named after Owen Hart, and they get his wife to like present the winner at the end, like present the the belt or something. Um, so there's still a lot of like people remembering him because obviously he died young and it's very tragic and he was really popular. But it, yeah, it's one of the most fucked up things in terms of how the industry responded to it at the time. It was really, yeah. really messed up. I think it's interesting to see the, the like the the shift that the um, like WWE I guess is taking now that as best I can tell it's clear McMahon is out. Uh, like, he's yeah he's he's, he's done gone. enough egregious. He's basically become the Steve Wynn they spent, of, of wrestling. It's funny they spent the whole WrestleMania weekend just burying him like yeah. he uh, not not by actually mentioning him. You're not allowed to mention him anymore. Right, like, right. You're not allowed to say his name on air anymore. Mm. But everybody was so glowing in how much they were talking about. Triple H, who's taken over yeah, from him. Yeah, yeah. They were all like praising him to high heaven all weekend and like just completely sucking him off about how great he is at this job to the point where it made it very obvious that all of them were essentially just saying, yeah, Vince is gone. Fuck him. We're like, we didn't like him anyway. Now we like the new guy, you know? So it was, it was a weird weekend of everybody passively trashing Vince McMahon. Yeah. I'd, I'm, I'd be shocked, or I guess I wouldn't be that shocked, but maybe we'll see a Bret Hart uh, return finally. Well, there was one already. Really? Yeah, he. Uh, he I made, didn't think they ever patched things up. Yeah, he he had a he had a match against Vince at like <laughs> WrestleMania in like 2010 or something. Oh my god. Uh, they were both old as fuck, and it was terrible. But yeah, yeah, of course. They did patch things up, um, and uh, I guess Bret needed some money, so you sure. Know, he, that makes sense. He that, was that's with, what, like, it's a whole, how it goes in wrestling. Well, that was what I was that was what I was about to say. So like, uh, you know, the Attitude Generation now is like becoming the executives. Like Triple H was a big part Which of. Which is super weird, yeah. Right, yeah. but but they all look so fucking good. Like 
Think mm-hmm. about when, like, Hogan and Ric Flair and, like, oh uh, you know, fucking uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan yeah. and and Animal and Hawk. Like, when yeah. they kept making their... They, they kept clinging to the last second oh, of fame. They looked like garbage. Yeah. The fucking Rock looks like he's 26 Unreal. years old. I, I, if you compare... Even if you compare 50... I think he's 51... The yeah. Rock. Yeah, yeah. If you compare him to 53-year-old Chris Jericho, who's right. in AW, mm. Jericho's in good shape for a 53-year-old. He's nothing compared to The Rock. Right. The Rock is in good shape it's for insane. a 30-year-old. Yeah. It's literally like he almost looks basically the same as he did 20 years ago. And it, I have I have no idea like what he puts into his body to, to make that happen, but it's credit to him because he must work fucking hard. Of course. Like, who cares what goes in? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if that's the result, yeah. seems like a positive one. He looks he looks fantastic. I mean the Undertaker Externally, looks pretty good. Oh Unde- well, yeah. Who knows? Yeah, there, there was a period though. Undertaker looks okay now, but there yeah. was a period where Undertaker was really banged up. Like yeah, he, yeah. there was if you look at his it was supposed to be his original last match in like 2017. It was it was terrible. Like he he was like clearly like 20 30 pounds overweight. Right, like right, he right. had like hip problems. He couldn't walk very well. And now that he's been retired for a while, he's like doing slightly better, I think. For those tall guys, though, they, they're they're not expected to have the the bodybuilder build or anything. Like yeah, that. I mean, like if you look at the guys who are six eight, seven foot tall, like how do you when you're fifty years old and you're seven foot tall, like how do you still stay in shape? It's got to be really difficult just to move around. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but man, Cena also looked fantastic, except for the bald. Spot. I was about to say, should have <laughs> left the hat on. Definitely should have left the hat on. It's so surreal to me, like, because he had like a crew cut for like his whole yeah career mostly, yeah, yeah, yeah. and now he's in Hollywood. He grew his hair out, right? And the bald patch that makes him look super old is so weird. Okay, to me. so this is the last thing we're gonna talk. Uh, there, there isn't anything else to talk about WrestleMania, but I want to touch on Cena for a second. <laughs> okay. Have any of you guys seen Ricky Stenicki? No. I've heard it's funny. Oh, okay, so it's a free movie. I think if you have Amazon Prime, John Cena is the lead. My best friend Danielle told me I have to watch this. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious. I'm a cheap laugh. It does not take much for me to laugh. I still to this day think Bridesmaid is the funniest movie ever made in the history of Hollywood, it's simply because Melissa McCarthy shits in the street. Like it's that's good enough. It's happening. Oh, it's happening. <laughs> It happened. And you're also still on the <laughs> Friends is Funny train. Friends, which is, I... Friends is phenomenal. One of the greatest shows ever. Seinfeld also. Uh, we were blessed in the 90s. But that's neither here nor there. I didn't even so much as crack a fucking smile mm. at Ricky Stenicki. And I need wow, to okay. know if I'm the, the outlier. What I heard. Like, I, it, I've not seen it. I've not heard it. I, I heard someone say it was funny, but that was just one random person. Everybody I've talked to claims it's funny, but I feel like none of them have actually watched it because it's so stupid. So here's, here's the funny thing about Cena, The Rock, etc. The Rock is the worst actor of all the three wrestlers who've become actors. The best is Dave Batista. Okay. Um, Batista is a legitimately really good actor. Mm. And my wife, who used to be in theater, worked with actors, directed plays and shit. Like, she loves his acting because he's done some really good performances. That's Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Cena is kind of good. Like, he's pretty funny in some stuff. And everyone thought when The Rock started, it was, everyone was like, oh, wow. Then the Rock, the Rock can act. You know, The Rock is, like, decent at acting. Turns out, if you put The Rock in anything other than just, like, a big action kind of role, he mm-hmm. can't do shit. Cena is kind of funny, but he can't do much beyond that. But Batista is the guy who can actually act, and no one expected that. Everyone thought, like, Batista was going to suck at acting, but turns out he's actually really good. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is interesting because The Rock is the highest paid actor in the exactly. world. <laughs> exactly. Can't act for shit, but you just put him Doesn't in action matter. movies. His movies make billions. Yeah, so I mean, the Rock, is, the Rock is like the, the Sylvester Stallone of this generation or the mm-hmm. Arnold of this generation. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. you just, I would think a lot of people would qualify four. them as good actors. Arnold, no. <laughs> Arnold can't act for shit. He like he, I don't, he can't do like what what role has Arnold done where he shows his acting chops? Kindergarten I'm cop was sick. Oh, kindergarten <laughs> cop was <laughs> sick. Commando. Yeah. Done. Twins. Uh, <laughs> kindergarten Twins? cop was Bob. Was he Commando or was Stallone Commando? No, no Commando still was yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Look, um, who is your daddy and what does he do? Is one of the best lines. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty strong. He's pretty strong. He, pretty some, strong. he actually yeah. has some banger movies. Predator. Mm-hmm. He does have some great movies. Terminator. Predator is one of his best, but that doesn't mean he's a great actor. There. Yeah, that's fair, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I would say Con- Stal- I would Conan say, the Barbarian. I would say Stallone is a better actor because he's actually good in Rocky. 
Stallone has. I was gonna say, like, I thought his role in Rocky is yeah, like, phenomenal. Every, every like a lot of these actors have movies where they're actually okay, but like mm-hmm. Arnold, like Arnold did like fucking Jingle All the Way and shit like that. It's like, Turbo like, Time. What do you mean? Yeah, <laughs> like these that, movies are classic. My favorite Arnold line is that "Put the cookie down" yeah. line from, <laughs> from Jingle All the Way. Yeah, yeah, that's, like, that's like the funniest <laughs> Arnold line. Uh, I mean, that is kind of the the meme with putting Arnold in comedy roles yeah. is that he's still just playing the Terminator just right. comedically. But that's why that's what I mean. Like, it's, so it's, it's funny, so but like good. I don't imagine that they had that in mind when they cast him. You know, they weren't just like, okay, we want you to play this comedy role, but just play it like the Terminator. Yeah, True like, Lies actually might have been his best role. I haven't seen that. Actually. Great. I haven't seen that. Uh, and oh, I'm not a big Jamie Lee Curtis fan, but I could see like her kind of carrying that script. That I mean, it, it was good. Yeah. Um, uh, James um, uh, Cameron. Cameron. James yeah. Cameron. Thank you. He was the director of it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. He's Wait a minute. Okay. Do you know that they Terminator. made a Kindergarten uh, Cop two? And no. It's, they made a Kindergarten Cop two in 2016, and Absolutely it's not, not Arnold. Absolutely not. You can't That's why that. nobody's. It's watched Dolph it. Lundgren. Yeah. Ooh, Wait, they're the same Ivan, age. Ivan Drago. It's Ivan Drago. What? Why would you but, pick? Why would you pay? So I was listening to a podcast. Uh, I just looked up Kindergarten Cop and saw this. What the Schwar- hell? Schwarzenegger just did a podcast with the Kelsey brothers. And uh, he said that he was actually cast to play uh, one of the villains in Rocky. And they were insinuating, like, would you have taken Dolph's role? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, who would be better? Mm -hmm. And and, uh, he made two good points. Number one, Dolph Lundgren was fantastic Mm -hmm. as uh, Ivan Drago. And number two... He's German, not Russian. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we were fighting the Cold War. Like the whole right. the whole undertone of the movie was exactly. was political. Yeah. But man, it would have been great if it was Arnold in Rocky Five instead of fucking Tommy that Gunn. Been great. Mm-hmm. Also, the American audience doesn't care who's Russian and who's not. How many, no, that's true. How no. many you non- s- Russian people have played Russians in movies? You could have snuck that one by the goalie so easy. <laughs> we would have <laughs> just been like, all right, I yeah, guess the, that's the a worst, Russian accent. The worst so for that is The Hunt for Red October because Sean fucking Connery plays a Russian dude. Yeah. Right. And he just has his Scottish accent with right, like a yeah. weird <laughs> Russian twinge to it. Nobody cared. Nobody, nobody noticed. Right. Put Absolutely the accent down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the person who should play every single foreign role from now until the end of time is John Malkovich. Oh, like, he's incredible. I actually don't even know what his true voice sounds like. <laughs> it's just a, like a normal, like um, middle-aged American yeah, accent. I, yeah, I feel, I feel like he's played an accent in every role yeah. that, that he's yeah. taken on. And I was just like, what does this guy actually sound he's like? He's the anti-Arnold, where Arnold only has one voice. Right. Malkovich doesn't even have his own voice. Right. He just has every <laughs> other voice. Yeah, that's actually very true. Uh, all right, let's get to a couple news and notes that we have to discuss. Uh, big shout out to Rob Kuhn. He agreed to a buyout today to stop fasting. This was day 16, I believe. Looks like he's going to get a buyout of 25K. You he's... say congratulations to him? Well, he chose to buy out. Yeah. He made money. He won. Oh, he won. He won 25K. He's... Yeah. He bet 3K to win 60 and then took 25. Yeah. Gotcha. I thought you meant he paid 25. Basically, D no. was just paying if, um, paying right, it right. back because, you know, I, I, the I hardest it. time of the challenge, mm-hmm. they let him, let him out. Okay, yeah. well, I have thoughts. Uh, Go on. I'm, I don't understand why these challenges keep ending early if the purpose of the bet is to prove that the person can't do the thing. They, they didn't prove anything. They didn't prove anything. Not, not. I mean, like, look, don't get me wrong. He did a 16-day fucking water fest. That is hard. That is a lot. That is hard. And if the original bet were, I bet you can't go 16 days without food, you we would fucking all be like, bro, you fucking did it, you man. Fucking did How much it. do you, you think uh, him. being able to drink coffee helped? A lot. A uh, fucking like that two-hour lot. window. Mm-hmm. A lot. I survived off pre-workout mm-hmm. when I did mine. Because you just don't have an appetite as much, right? Uh, it, it's an appetite suppressant. It also like keeps you from crashing. Because you know, at the end of the day, like you're you're it's, it's deep, a, deep, deep into ketosis. Yeah, it's a stimulant, so it's just gonna just keep it going. Right. Well, so <laughs> so there are a couple things to play here. Like when you go that deep into ketosis, uh, you're really sharp at least for some period of time mentally you're locked in but physically you know you start to drain because you don't have much glycogen in your stores and uh you don't want to break down too much muscle so like being a little bit immobilized i guess is helpful for that um but yeah the stimulant on top of the fact that you're in ketosis like you really feel like you're a superhero Mm -hmm. and that's got to be a pretty good feeling it's also an appetite suppressant so I'm sure that that was really helpful. How much would he have won if he would have... Um, 60K. 60K? So yeah. he got uh, 40% or whatever. So yeah. basically, we saw two bets in the past three months. Yeah. And both of them, the person probably, you know, there's a good chance that person did not would not have made it. And I would say it's probably over, you know. I told Deeb this, 
and 50%. yeah i told deep this and i still i still hold to this uh Sticking to i it. don't think he would have made the what was it 17 and a half percent or 18 percent yeah i don't think he would have made it in the time allotted uh, I think he would have got close. Yeah, I was going to say, even, even so, it might have just been a close sweat. Yeah, I, like, I think he would have got close, but I don't think he would have made it. And I don't think Rob would have made 30 days. Yeah, it's like, you're not going to blow this out by any I means. I mean, obviously, Sean thought he was going to if he agreed to the buyout. Yeah, but he's also getting a pretty good price. He's yeah, paying he's getting, less than half. No, And right. you also don't even know, like, it's, it's 14 more days left. That's paying so less wrong. than half, and he was already halfway over, done. Like, slightly so, over halfway. Yeah. Sounds like a just pay um, spot. Which was the exact opposite of Perkins. I don't think, like... Like Sean wasn't really eighty percent. What was like that buyout for? Eight hundred or eight fifty? How did I miss that? Um, you were probably just zoned out, like I usually maybe. do. Yeah, you were probably googling when Owen Hart died. It was over the edge, by the way. Oh, nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. Oh, okay, I remember guys, that one. Guys, yeah. by the way, yeah. this is a new pod meme. Arnold is not German. He's Austrian. Yeah. Same Austrian. thing. <laughs> Right, right. It's like Again, yeah. Americans, who knows, who in this country knows the difference between Austria and Germany? You know, like, I, I do. appreciate the, the fact that very... nobody in the chat fucking corrected or anything. I appreciate that. I mean, it's, you know? it's, all Americans. It's, it's all Americans. Americans. You know what? I'm going to give him a one for the Conrad interruption. That was a good one. They speak, mm -hmm. they speak the valuable. same language. Is that right? They do. Okay, yeah. same thing. It's like Canada and the United States. What the fuck did he just say? Him? You can't even go to Canada if you got a DUI. What on earth does that have to do with anything? What do you mean? How is it the same? Try telling Austrians that Austria and Germany are the yeah. same. <laughs> well, let's see how that goes. Germany has a bit of a smudge on it, Matt. I don't know if you're aware. Maybe they want to distance themselves from that. Well, fun fact, Hitler was Austrian. There you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, so maybe they. That's maybe partly, it's the other way that's around. That's partly why maybe, you shouldn't mix the two up. Maybe Germans <laughs> want to distance themselves from Austria. <laughs> we can play a game of like Fedor's crew. You know, German or Austrian. Ready? Mario Mosbach. Austrian. Austrian. German. You're right. He's wrong. <laughs> um, what, the opposite of whatever Conrad thinks. <laughs> nice. All right. Since everyone's interrupting, it wasn't Melissa McCarthy that took a shit in the middle of the I knew yeah. that too. No, I knew that too, but I didn't want to correct him. Why? Well, that's it, fine. It was... Um, Fuck your shit. It was the, the, the girl from uh, Saturday Night Live. Yeah, the one from name. Saturday Night Live. No, it's the main character. Kristen the Wiig. Oh, getting, Kristen Wiig? No, yeah. no, no, no. The one no, no. that was getting married. She was a little darker oh, skinned. Oh, Maya Rudolph. Maya Rudolph. Rudolph. Thank you. She was one of shit in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have never seen that Melissa McCarthy shit somewhere for sure. In the sink. Oh, yeah. no, okay. she puked in. Yeah, she puked in. Yeah, I, I don't think it was puke. She, yeah, I think it was shit. That movie, that she that movie sounds uh, like the least funny movie I've ever heard. Bro, you life. have no idea. It, Are you great. eight years old? Are it you is, literally no. eight years old? Yes, that's what I was it, saying. It, it, it is, is nonstop laughter. I mean, you can't get thirty seconds to breathe. It oh. sounds like it would be nonstop laughter. For it's, not, or like, it's not all poop jokes. Also, do you think you? It's might, a lot of poop jokes. I didn't say. I said. Not well, you're right. You're right. Poop. You're right. When when they lay off the poop jokes, they go to sex jokes. Yeah. Well, also, do you it's, think the, it's a dude movie written by girls? <laughs> do you think the rippity dippity that John Cena's in? I'm um, sorry. The what? The rippity dippity. Uh, Ricky Stenicki. Ricky Stenicki. Yeah, that one. Um, do you think that you would like it if it wasn't um, Danielle that? No. Told you about it? Oh, no, okay. no, no. I was excited to watch it. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, there it is. There it is. See, I told you she shit in sink. All right. <laughs> <Not so. laughs> it feels like fire. Look, Hunt's smiling. He's smiling. <laughs> oh, you I'm, smiling. <laughs> I'm smiling at you guys, you <laughs> fucking morons. <laughs> uh, no, I was excited to watch I am it. I'm really smiling it. at your taste in comedy. <laughs> uh, comedy of our generation, right there. Yeah, comedy man. of your country. Yeah, I was going to say. I have, the oh. I have the privilege as a Brit of looking down on American comedy. Right. Brit's humor isn't even the, good. Their, com their comedy is sophisticated, okay? Yeah, exactly. We, Mr. Bean? I mean, uh, we really? at least have to be able to tell ourselves that. <laughs> We can't, we can't just shit in a fucking street. You've got to give us something to be proud of, all right? We we are a very, very terrible country at most things. Comedy point. is something we're not that Mr. bad at. Bean. I only yeah. really know Ricky Gervais to be a great British comedy. Oh, fuck comedian. him. I hate Ricky Gervais so much. I, think, I actually think he's hilarious. I, I think he... I also think he's a good actor. I think he started out funny, and as soon as he got popular, he got way worse. He got way less funny because he started just saying everything for shock value. Everything was just like the most controversial thing he could yeah, possibly say. Yeah, I think say. I like that. Um, yeah, see, that like in in the UK, that doesn't get you very far mm. because there's a bunch of comedians that are actually innovative and saying stuff that's like new and you haven't really heard this kind of humor before, and that's what he started out as. But then he just he, as soon I like as John he Oliver. got famous, 
Well, like John Oliver. John, that's the funny thing is John Oliver is not very big in the UK. John yeah. Oliver is not. Okay, so the only the British UK, really. comedians I find funny are the ones that you guys disown. Well, it's, because, <laughs> it's because what happens is they get big in the UK, and then as soon as they get big enough in the UK that they hit like critical mass, they start trying to like conquer America. You know, they go to the states and try to get big over there. Where the real money is. Yeah, exactly. Because you can't, you can only make so much money being okay, big. Okay, so in I the can't UK. even ask you for references because they're all people I've never heard of. Well, honestly, I've been living here long enough that I don't even know who's who's like the the up and coming comedians now. You know, so like all the British comedians that I used to watch um, when you know, like TV shows that were that were there when I was when I was uh, back in the UK, most of them are either, you know, they've tried and failed to get popular in the US or they have already become popular in the we, US. We can all agree Mr. Bean is terrible, right? Mr. Bean Mr. is, is great. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Bean is like, uh, first of all, it's like 30 years old. And it's so fucking like, hilarious. I mean, it, it definitely has its moments, but I, I do not know who made that show, because, like who, who created that show, because it is a weird concept. Mr. Bean is the British equivalent to Eric Andre. It's just... Uh, no, nah, Eric Andre's cool. No, he's not. Mr. Bean's the guy that doesn't talk and just runs around places, right? Right. Kind of, yeah. 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 But he <laughs> just like does things that are disruptive and like yeah. cr very cringe comedy. What I, what I will hilarious. say, though, about Mr. Bean is the guy who plays Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, is an absolute legend. He is the, one of the most legendary comedic actors in, in all I truly of the didn't UK. know he had a real name. You have I to. I thought it was Mr. Bean. You <laughs> have to be a legend to a fucking play legend. that role. I thought his last name was just Bean. His first name was Mr. <laughs> like, to get that off, you have to be a legend. He is yeah. a legend. And he, the, Mr. Be. Bean was partially what made him a legend. Yeah. yeah. All Mr. Right. Mr. Well, Mr. Bean. We've run the gamut. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's, I guess, get into a little bit of Talk strat chat. Pocket, shall we? Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I can preface this with, uh, I, I don't like this brand of poker anymore. <laughs> well, once you, you once mean? you move down to the one, two streets, you're just going to be forced to play. Right. It. I, I, you know, I used to really enjoy this brand of poker and, yeah. uh, I think for a period of time, it almost was my identity to a certain degree. Like I played a lot of quote unquote hood poker, mm -hmm. you know, doing a lot of like cold calling, a lot of, a lot of things that forced multi-way action. And when hood flatting, yeah, a lot of hood flatting. We love hood flats. Um, and I think that, you know, there was a reason for that. If, if, if people are bad and you get a bunch of them together in a pot stands to reason that that benefits you in some sort of capacity, if you know what's going on. Um, and then I think like when theory started to become a little bit more popular and I dug my feet or, or I, I guess I dug in a little bit more and studied, I realized um, everything that is meant to be uh, understood about this game very quickly breaks under the stress of multi-way pots, mm -hmm. uh, especially when there are glaring imbalances at the root node. Right, so the big thing about heads up pots are that no matter how awful your opposition is, they can't be that far out of construction for what the situation calls for, right? So if you open under the gun and someone incredibly terrible flats middle position and you go heads up, at most, they're gonna have a button flat range, right? Like maybe, maybe like, a big, all right, at worst, they'll have a big blind flat range, which seemed pretty egregious. But the point is, like, you can find a theoretical range to attribute to them, right? They're never going to be so wide that you're just like, oh, well, for fuck's sake. I, I mean, I'm, guess, I'm against, like, 80% of hands here. Uh, Guapo and I played uh, some 1-2 at, um, at the Hard Rock Seminole. Um, we were waiting for our flight after the cruise and there was a gentleman who was playing literally 100 percent of hands right and the thing with that where i was going with this is that will now encourage more multi-way action yeah oh yeah right. right so i'm saying like when pots go heads up mm -hmm. it's very unlikely your opposition has a range that's so wide it doesn't fit into a normal position yeah right <laughs> because the wider a person flats either the more three betting or the more flatting behind will start to occur right so generally speaking, if pots make their way to being heads up, even if it's not your position versus the big blind, the person that you're up against is going to have some level of construction, even if it's so wide that we're saying his level of construction is a big blind defense, mm -hmm. right? Once it starts to go multi-way, 
Oh, baby. All bets are off. Mm -hmm. I've seen the most egregious shit just in one week on a boat playing 501k where people don't three bet. Getting five to one. I got a call. I saw hands that wouldn't want to put money in the middle if you fucking spotted them a rebate. And then I saw other hands that never, never want to call, just want to put their entire stack in the middle. <laughs> I, I saw somebody as the fourth caller with queens. It's like, how? How did you know yeah. that the big blind was going to have jacks here? Mm -hmm. How did you know this, man? And then man. How, how often... How often does the big blind not have jacks here? And we don't get to see that you fucking were the third caller with queens. Right. Because you either pick it up post or it comes ace king high and you just casually fold to a C bet. So I don't I don't know what to do anymore. You're, you're <laughs> tilted I'm by broken. all the I, I, see, there was there was a spot where I opened Kings under the gun and the entire table called and I looked to my right at Isha and I go, I hate it here. <laughs> <laughs> see, this, is, this is funny because the way your policy on multiway or your approach to multiway is evolving is the exact opposite of mine. I love multiway because okay. I have been studying it. I have been I'm in the middle of making a course about multiway and I'm using Rocket Solver to run a whole bunch of sims for like weird spots like six handed and shit like that. And I am super interested in multiway because A, everyone sucks at it, and B, there are so many more variables that mean that you, you have like strategies that don't normally exist that start to come up, right? So you get weird concepts emerging like, uh, you know, you'll, you'll bet in a certain spot and then when player A calls, now your turn strategy looks like this, but when player C calls, your turn strategy looks totally different. And it completely transforms uh, what we normally would look at as our sort of standardized strategies in a lot of spots. So I am personally becoming like super excited about playing more multi-way and I'm super happy to force people to do it in tournaments because everyone, everyone sucks at it. You like know, it's very strange because I greatly enjoy playing bomb pods hmm. and that's the most extreme version of it it is but yeah. i think that's I think, different because it's forcing everybody to play at their worst hands i i think that's the the common theme here is that i don't care how many players see a flop if i can range them yes like i feel like so much of my underlying skill set is being able to range my opposition see you're I, it's interesting that you look at it that way because the way i've always responded to that when students would come and say like well how am i supposed to range somebody when you know they're really wide is is that the re saying that they're really wide is ranging them, right? In that you're saying like, well, they naturally, if, they're, if they have 40% of the deck here, that is a wide and weak range, which on any given board texture is going to include a lot of trashy hands. And you don't need to know much more than that. So that's the way I look at it. Uh, it see, it I seems did, like you're going I think further. on flop, that's true. But I think on later streets, that becomes very problematic. Like, I see what you mean. It's very Sorry. difficult for me to understand... Like, in a heads-up spot at any formation, I can understand the concentration of flushes versus non-flush hands mm -hmm. my opponent's going to have when the flush card feels. Right. I have a very difficult time having vision over that when I have no idea where the boundary is for their suited hands. Mm. Or when um, the fourth caller just calls with queens. Right. Yeah. No, I see what you mean. I see how it does. It certainly makes... It certainly adds ambiguity to, to later streets in a lot of spots. And, and also just having to add certain uh, strong hands back into their range where you would otherwise be able to easily never, eliminate. Never yeah. Have. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like it comes queen seven, three. You're like, okay, nobody has two pair here and nobody has top set. And then you like see hands like seven, three and top set of queens. <laughs> it's like, well, well God damn it. Mm. Uh, oh, they also have a lot more nothing collectively, but I'm up against a higher concentration of, of made hands. And it becomes tricky because so much of your value range is driven by single pairs, mm -hmm. right? It's just about having the ace queen advantage or the Kings, the ace advantage over the collective field, but uh, it's very hard, and I know this is a big problem for the audience, it's very hard not to just fall back on your heels and turn those hands into your bluff catchers, mm -hmm. which yeah. feels like a big problem to our strategy overall. Yeah, I think that the thing that um, people tend to struggle with a lot with multi-way is simply the fact that you, you win the pot much less often, sure. right? So you start to feel like, well, I'm losing all these pots, how could I possibly be still making money when all these players are in the hand? Mm -hmm. the, the thing that I've discovered from running a lot of multi-way sims that's really interesting is that it, what tends to happen with these spots is that there are a lot of board textures where your EV 
becomes way lower than what it would be if, if, if it was heads up. Yep. Simply because your range is, is more weighted towards uh, being distributed in the, you know, the, the high cards, being distributed in strong preflop hands. But you then get to situations where when the board texture does come out favorably for you, you make so much money that it, comp it, it compensates all those other spots. Mm -hmm. So you'll have situations where, you know, for example, I'm looking at like some, some six-way pots where we're the opener, we make it three bigs and five people call. And then you get to the flop and there's a lot of board textures where in an 18 big blind pot, your EV is less than uh, 300 big blinds per hundred. So you're making less than three big blinds from that 18 big blinds. Mm -hmm. Um, there's not that many, but there are some. And then on the flip side, there are a couple of textures, like the very most favorable ones. Like if you look at like the Ace King Deuce Rainbow, that texture, now we're winning 900 bigs per hundred. We're winning half of that 18 big blind pot because everybody else is so wide and we are so dense to strong hands. And that's just one example from a, an arbitrary set of ranges that I ran it with. Right. But I thought it was really interesting to see how big the <laughs> scope of variation was in what the the player with the strongest ranges EV would be. Like go to go from we're winning two big blinds out of 18 on the worst boards to now we're winning half the pot in a six-way pot on the the best boards. It's really interesting. I mean like multi is just so so broken where the computing power necessary to even mm -hmm. have an accurate solve is it very difficult it's hard like yeah. looking at like a whiz database and it's not like a shot at the at the whiz but like it, it only has up to four callers versus mm -hmm. like, in a spot like versus open it goes like open call like in this spot like i just put 100 big blinds doesn't really matter undergun opens undergun one has calls low jack doesn't have calls anymore because mm -hmm. it's going to take many years to run to right. get to mm -hmm. some reasonable amount of accuracy yeah so you're just kind of like making some adjustments and then it goes like let's say under the gun calls, under the gun one calls, the cutoff calls, and now I'm at the button, and the button doesn't play calls. Mm -hmm. right. and it's not because it won't play calls, but because you're not going to get an answer for it. Right, and it, then you have the added variable that as every range is dependent on the ranges that come before it to some degree. So yeah. when you're running a sim where you have, if, if you allow six players to call, the, the frequency that each of those individual players calls is going to be quite low. And even if there is a calling range, by the time you get to the point where the sim is running iterations of what the sixth player's calling range is supposed to be, it's such a low number of iterations that the accuracy that you get over that specific range is much lower. So you would have to do something like what you can do with HRC, where you specifically run that portion of the tree to a very high resolution so that you can be confident that the sim is actually going to run enough iterations to get an accurate range. But even then, if you were to lock one of the previous ranges and you, you have it so that one player involved in the hand has a range that's way wider than what it's supposed to be, it throws everything off because now the equity of hands changes. You, you get a whole bunch of different variables in there. And what I've found so far is that even in situations where uh, you've got you know, four or five players going to a flop, in a, in a circumstance where the solver would say, well, you should never have a calling range in this spot. You should play three bet or fold. If everybody is punting by putting money in the pot way too wide, the solver starts to say, well, maybe we can call because there's a bunch of trashy hands in the pot that shouldn't be in there. It is interesting to think that like maybe in, you know, two, three, five years from now, because the solves are going to get so much faster and mm -hmm. stronger and just the way technology moves that we are going to start seeing these solves in multi-way spots and it's going to change the game. Right, because mm -hmm. like now all of a sudden, where you just think, "Oh, I, I'm, I have no flats here." Now you do have flats, and now you, yep. somebody else has flats, and now you just are seeing multi-way flops like way more common. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's the direction <clears throat> we're headed, and I, I I like that direction personally because I think there's so much more complexity to mm -hmm. it that favors players who understand the game in a theoretical way compared to players who just brute force their way through heads up pots. Like if you you can be like kind of decent at this game just by understanding that in heads up pots you have to bluff a lot but it's a lot harder to be decent if you play multi-way and you don't understand things like sizings and you don't understand different positions and how it affects your frequencies and all sorts of stuff like that so i, I personally i love multi-way and I'm, I'm getting more and more into it the more i i work on this course i think one of the biggest challenges that everybody's going to face is again since the majority of your strategy is driven by your one pair type of holdings and the ev for those are just generally going to go down when you're multi-way, there becomes this weird, and like this is 
where we get into like this whole notion of just pay where it's like the reason <laughs> the reason i promote that so heavily is so that people don't play aces so defensively right right like you don't want to get in a habit where you just stop value betting period mm -hmm. yeah and you only have like two pair plus anytime that you put any money into the pot actively uh i think that the reason why heads up is so attractive is because it becomes there, there's like a clear template for how you're supposed to approach these spots and if and when over pairs actually can begin to fold right and generally it takes a lot of uh texture change in order for an over pair to get worth so little that it becomes indifferent versus a bet mm -hmm. um that often will require like straight cards falling, flush cards falling, whatever. But on dry textures where you hold an overpair, like come hell or high water, you generally stack off as long as you're not putting in like multiple, multiple bets on a single street. Mm -hmm. And multi-way, it you just like can't do that. Like you you actually are punting if you're the only one that's getting stacked with aces uh in a single raised five way pot. Um and everybody else in your pool is like finding ways to get away here. It becomes very tricky because like you're you're really towing a fine line between what's theoretical and then what's like heavily exploitable. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that to be like the frustrating part. It's not it's not from the redlining side. I can find my bluffs. That's easy. They don't. They're, they're, it's it's funny. Multi way. Your bluffs are actually so much more clear than your value. Because uh, the equity of a bluff doesn't change based off the number of opponents all that much. If you have a gut shot, it's a gut shot to the nuts. Doesn't matter, yeah. right? Just really doesn't matter. Like right. you may because have you, fewer outs left. You, you hit you hit one of your full cards, or you don't. Yeah, you exactly, right. precisely, right? And uh, the blocking power that you'll have over the texture, it's going to reduce some of their calls in some sort of capacity as a collective. But like, whatever, they're going to continue with what they continue with. Mm -hmm. But when you have aces and it's just a board, uh, it's like well. Every board has sets and no one's folding pairs. So like collectively the ranges are going to be more dense to sets than they would be in a heads up pot. Right. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has like broadways. So like collectively they're all going to have more top pairs, but they're also really sensitive to facing aggression. So like top pair just folds at a much higher frequency versus any level of aggression in multi-way pots than it does in heads up pots. Uh, and I think this becomes like the difficulty in navigating these scenarios is how do we manipulate the field to pay us when we're value betting without us over investing in portions of our range that are subject to be drawing dead mm -hmm. to the strongest portions of their range. Yeah. And a lot of <laughs> it's funny because based on the Sims that I've been running, a lot of the time the answer just is like you just bet 10, be 10, be 10. Yeah. You know, just be just small, bet 10% pot. Sizes, yeah. Like there's the. I don't want to, you know, spoil the course, but like the the sims that I'm running, I, I with these six way sims I ran, I've I've almost finished running a full 184 flop subset mm -hmm. of uh, this specific six way configuration, SPR of like five and a half basically, and uh, by far the dominant strategies with the with the preflop raiser being the third of six players to act, um, it, it's checking like 70 percent, it's B10 like. 20 25 percent and then there's like a small sliver of five to ten percent of b33 3e and then a tiny tiny bit on like one or two flops of uh 2e where it just tries to you know get the money now yeah. with certain hands yeah um but basically the the bulk of the strategy like you say is you don't put a lot of money <coughs> however there's a lot of really interesting spots where it goes like you you B10 flop with a bunch of hands. Then, you know, you get called in two spots. You B33 turn. You get called in one spot. And now your head's up on the river and you get to bomb. Right, right, right. right or, yeah, yeah. like, you, you B10 flop. You get called in one spot. Uh, but depending on who it is, if they have a really condensed range, there's going to be some spots where, like, turn comes one card. You just can never bet anything. Turn comes another card they get absolutely wrecked and you can bet your entire range. Right. So there's so many weird divergences based on board texture and things like that, that this is why it becomes really interesting. That to resonates to me because you start to see like weird divergences. Yeah, you know? that re resonates, or, uh, that, that, that resonates. resonates with me because uh, that's my approach to bomb pots. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You try to clear the field with a small bet and then based off their positioning and the actions that they could have taken mm -hmm. up until this point, 
you're able to actually uh, narrow, narrow in on their range because the biggest thing about bomb pots is people won't slow play. Yeah. So like if you're third to act in a bomb pot and you B10 and you know you get one fold and then a call, that's almost never uh, a strong hand. Mm -hmm. That's like one pair or worse <laughs> almost exclusively because there isn't enough aggression that takes place by the field behind him. Yeah. Right? There aren't enough people. And when there is, it's just a trap. So, like, you don't want to trap a trap, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, you raising here is not going to make the, the previous guy who is trapping suddenly fold. He's just going to put in more money. So, like, you're incentivized, right? Right. So, once that happens, and now let's say you go heads up or uh, one of the early checkers also calls. It's like, well, you are very much against uh, a one pair holding and draws at a really, really high frequency. So, when bricks roll off, you just get to polarize. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, that all makes a ton of sense, but it's also a lot easier because everybody's playing hundred percent of hands. Yeah. Right. It's, it's when they have that choice preflop. Mm -hmm. Now you can trap a little bit more versus the B10 because it's just going to go heads up to the turn a lot. Yeah. Um, so it is interesting to me. It does sound like this rocket solver would be like pretty, pretty fascinating to, um, build a bomb pot course off of. I I've been, you know what though? I, um, I've been trying to, so what I've been doing for, for some of the sims for the the course is running shorthanded bomb pots as a, a baseline mm -hmm. or how certain factors like SPR and position and things like that are affecting the sims. As soon as I got to trying to run a bomb pot that was more than five ways, it, well, at, even for three, four, five way bomb pots, I had to keep the SPR relatively low and keep the game tree fairly simple with right. each player only having one size mm -hmm. and, not, and like a 30% size, not like a B10 size. Okay. And then as soon as you get to like six ways and beyond bomb pots, like I have 64 gigs of RAM in my computer and my computer can't handle a tree for a, a six way bomb pot. So, I mean, I don't know how much better than mine your computer is. I know it's better, but... It, I think you would need a lot of RAM to build a tree for a full nine-way bomb pot. That's fair. Even if you simplified the tree quite a lot. And I think if we, if we start thinking about like a, a nine-way bomb pot where players have tiny bet size options and multiple sizes, I think you'd honestly be looking at like one terabyte of RAM. You'd probably yeah, yeah. Need. So yeah. like, I still think we're a long way away from any solver existing that can actually solve nine-way bomb pots in... in a high degree of complexity but we can figure out some principles from these shorthanded spots i could run a bunch of three-handed bomb pots really easily with a, a fairly simple game tree so that's kind of what i started with and yeah hopefully at some point in future uh we'll be able to go further with it yeah you could probably pull some principles out of that i do notice that like three-handed bomb pots are very simple in nature to to kind of like real-time solve yeah they, um, they actually are surprisingly like it, it's surprisingly straightforward three-handed bomb pots at least if you're keeping the tree you know relatively like manageable and the spr is not too high yeah and i i'm even like just saying uh like brain solving like right, yeah. it, it's it's very easy to kind of figure out how three 100 ranges are supposed to act in that particular uh formation whereas like nine-handed you're just you're lost yeah because you, <laughs> you start to get to a point where you don't know where the boundary is where a certain hand is pretty strong three-handed four-handed etc but how weak does a certain hand get when you're eight-handed, nine-handed? Right. You know, like, at what point are you starting to, like, you flop trips and you're like, well, this isn't very good. You yeah. Know, like, at, do you still think a trips is good at nine-handed or are you only comfortable flopping trips when it's five-handed or lower? Like, it's really hard to know. You right, just right, can't right, really yeah. easily figure it out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, well, I guess uh, we have an example of a uh, multi-way spot. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, it's... Um, Kind of. Okay. It, is, it is a multi-way spot. It, yeah, it is, it is a multi-way spot. <laughs> it's so. a okay. it's, uh, it's not, I think, a great example of uh, a spot that has the level of complexity that we're kind of talking about because mm. it's just raise, three bet, and two cold calls, and then you go to the flop, super low SPR. So that is one type of spot that does come up, and I've, I've certainly spoken with students of mine who have been struggling with situations like that. But when you're at a, a low SPR going to the flop, it does get a lot simpler because you just you just follow your equity. You know, you eventually right. you just get to a point where your hand is too good to to ever fold, and um, you you don't benefit a ton from from you know playing multiple streets when the SPR is going to be so low that you, know, you barely even benefit from it at all. So 
I, I think it's a spot that we can we can talk about for sure, but I, I don't know if it fits a lot of what we've just been talking about. Okay, that's fair. Uh, what do you got? Okay, we got a submission from uh, JP Poker. They're playing uh, two five and with a ten dollar straddle. Uh, the obviously the replayer is not going to show the straddle because it wouldn't do that. But um, so <clears throat> what happens is there's a straddle from seat four, and um, under the gun then ra raises to thirty, and our hero is in the low jack with a king of spades, king of diamonds. E3 bets to uh, 95. They're 1,100 effective. And it falls to the small blind who flats the three bet, hood flat. <laughs> and then, yeah, big blind, got to come along. Here yep. we go. Yeah. Uh, calls. The straddler folds, and now the original razor folds as well. And we get a flop of nine of clubs, six of spades, three of spades. And the small blind decides to just lead out for uh, two-thirds pot. Okay. So 200 into 330 ish. Uh, big blind folds, and we decide to just call. And the turn is a seven of spades, and small blind rips all in, and we call and win the hand with queens. Now you're wondering, like, this yeah, hand. You had queens. You had queens. Yeah. So we, yeah, we win the hand against queens. Yeah. Um, and you're probably wondering, like, okay, this is. Pretty straightforward. What, what is going on here? Well, what our, is going on here? Our hero was highly considering folding the flop. Or I'm sorry, folding folding the turn. Okay. I'm um, still wondering what's going on here. Yeah. So they said the small blind snap jams exclamation point hero with a bunch of question marks, and then it said what is going on here? I beat queen queen jack jack. Could I just be drawing dead? No. Have we taught you nothing? <laughs> Just yeah, I mean, the, the answer is, like, you can't rule out the fact right. that you're drawing dead. Yeah. But it's so unlikely. Right. Because you have the king of spades. Like, mm -hmm. you, yeah, you just can't fall. It's so, really, really, really hard to jam the nut flush there. Yeah. And expect to get paid. That's what I mean. Like, it's also be hard to lead on flop with the nut yeah. flush draw. Like, yeah. what, 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 what are we doing? Yeah, Unless like, you're just ace, trying to, it's hard to flat free. Yeah, you're just trying to lead, get flush, it in. You know? like, uh, yeah. It, 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 well, yeah, it's not I, hard. You just click call. Well, that's true. <laughs> oh, that's wow. True. Yeah, he I, said, uh, so J, JP said, uh, I probably would have leaned towards a fold without the king of spades. Well, that's a very different equation. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, I still don't know. Just, I, I would never fold kings, period. period. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. but, but I would is, also just, like, raise so I guess more yeah, if like I didn't I have the just, king of spades. I would never be just calling flop. If we yet. go back to the to pre-flop, obviously, I think what he did was standard, right? So you have, you have a straddle. Uh, under the gun, you know, opens. We have a clear three bet with mm -hmm. our hand. Now, when you get to the villain in the small blind with queens, and it's already you already have a lot of people's left to act. You have the big blind, the straddle, the original opener, and now the three better, and you have queens. What do we think about his flat there? Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. So like you can't really like. I think if you're gonna have flats, it's important to have queens because like you want to be able to back jam whenever under the gun. You know, tries to pick the pot up with yeah. like ace queen. But I mean, we whatever. surely we shouldn't have flats. Right? There. No. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. I, I don't think the the problem is that you're investing too much money pre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what makes post flop so simple here for kings is the SPR is only three. Wizard mm -hmm. strat straddle ranges are pretty sick here, actually. Do you think? Do you think he th um, is worried? Like when he's considering folding the turn. Is it like because, well, he said queen, does he have queens or jacks? But maybe he thinks that like those hands just four bet. So like why? Like, I think it's I don't just beat, more. I don't beat enough. I mean, I like, think those I, are the hands that I beat, but they should they shouldn't exist. Well, then the, the, the problem is nothing else should exist either. Right. right? Like yeah. that's that's the thing here. It's not like queens or jacks should four bet, but some other hands should cold like call. Like nines or, or right. sevens. Nothing, or, nothing should cold call or here. Or sixes so or threes that have that could have flopped the set. So you end up in a situation where the, like when someone has a range in a spot where a range shouldn't exist you mm -hmm. now are forced to figure out like what mistake are they making are mm -hmm. they making the mistake of <clears throat> excuse me are they making the mistake of like they have ace king off and they just flat for no reason or yeah. they have uh just any pair and they can't fold it you know they don't want to fold pairs like what mistake are they making because right. this is clearly a mistake i also just don't think at this spr this isn't what i was talking about like these aren't spots where you are concerned about stacking off with an over pair right like you're not investing too much money if you just run into a set almost always here. 
um, it's only three SPR, and you need hands to stack off with. If not kings, then what? You know what I mean? Like, the mm-hmm. bottom for your stack off range here can't be sets. Right. There always has to be a slightly reluctant or slightly uncomfortable call off range, right? right? There has to be a call off range that isn't super excited to call off. And we're not like massively excited here. Like we don't have the nuts, but we have a hand that's definitely in that region of like, well, it's a, it's a pretty good hand. Like it's really tough to, it's really tough to call. And if we start folding this hand, we're literally saying we're never calling without two pair plus. And since we can't really ever have a set because we three bet pre against under the gun, we're saying, we can literally only call with a flush. I don't, know about, I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty excited here. Well, yeah, uh, I'm mean, pretty I, fucking happy. Well, what, I, what I mean is, like, we we're not in a position where we can be so confident that we just almost never lose, right? Yeah, no, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, occasionally, of course, of course. occasionally they just have aces somehow, yeah. or occasionally mm-hmm. they have nines or whatever, right? Like, yeah, of but we're, we're still, yeah, we're never even thinking about folding here. But the 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 basically, I guess what I mean is that we are always going to have to have some kind of a range that doesn't beat all of their value right? right we can't we can't only stack off with the hands that beat their value because that's such a narrow range in any spot that we can never have enough of those hands your threshold needs to include something that makes you shake yeah, yeah like <laughs> tens and jacks don't feel great here but like right, yeah, yeah. also how are we ever folding tens or jacks it yeah. seems crazy like, i think without a i think like <clears throat> jacks no spade kind of feels a bit weird because yeah we don't have the straight draw we don't have a spade so like i, I could maybe right. see i could maybe see finding yeah. a fall with like red jacks here i i feel like uh you know jp our, our hero here i think if he has 10 there he's just gonna fold but like if he's considering folding the kings right well you can't fold tens just... because you have a straight draw right so yeah. like that i mean that well, doesn't mean well, doesn't maybe, mean maybe that jacks, much right? he, he would have mocked the, the tens yeah yeah but then tens shouldn't i mean be... i can't really speak for him but it seems that way the way he was yeah you know, i imagine so but like ten, tens isn't pure three bet pre anyway even jacks like shouldn't pure three bet pre in this yeah. formation regardless so like you i think you when you have that a little that little additional bit of equity like when you have a spade or when you have a straight draw as well you just shouldn't fold because you're still mm-hmm. live against some of his value. Like when you're still live against a, like a set of nines or something, you're, if you have tens, you're still live against queens here, especially if you have a spade. Uh, I don't think you should fold, but it, as soon as you get to a point where you are needing them to specifically either have value that you're way ahead of or a bluff in order for you to, to be in good shape, like when you do have red jacks here, you need them to have tens or you need them to have like ace king with the ace of spades somehow. That becomes a little bit dicier, but if you have queens, they can have jacks. Like that's where the point. I, I think the point of never folding here for me is is queens, ja- red jacks. I might sometimes think about, but I'd probably just be all in on flop anyway. So yeah, it wouldn't even matter. Yeah, Does yeah. small blind have? I'm sorry, you said small blind shouldn't be three bet four betting um, jacks and tens. They shouldn't pure. be cold calling. They probably should be four betting. They do four, four bet. They, 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 they four bet. Yeah. Jacks pure tens mix folds. Okay. Queens actually just jam small blind. Yeah, like I was gonna, I was I was yeah. gonna say jam was probably the option with queens and ace king. Queens, um, ace king, kings like twenty percent. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't gonna say those hands should fold. I was just specifically they shouldn't really cold call them. My my fear is what this range looks like from the small blind that cold calls and then leads. Mm-hmm. So what's the worst value hand I think exists? Probably tens, right? Does ace mm-hmm. king off with a spade exist? Probably not. Well, you know? I mean if. In real, list, in real life, in, practice, in yeah. real life, that should exist. Yeah. In real so, life, man. at the 2 five table, that should exist. I don't think Ace King just leads, though. Like, uh, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, I, don't, I understand. Uh, yeah, that part, like, yeah. The, the well, desire the, to lead is to protect your range. But, like, you're going to face a C-bet. Ace King doesn't really want to face a C-bet. Well, the desire to lead is to protect your hand, right? But Ace yeah. King doesn't need protection. And you don't think about, well, oh, doesn't what doesn't want to check with? fold, is my point. I don't think it just takes lead, a lead strat, though. I don't know. You know, so but like it's, I guess that's, that's not something we're gonna see a lot, but we, we will see it once in a blue fucking moon. But I guess that's this is where the issue comes in when it like I think about even flop flat is like the bluff that exists is very rare, if not not like non-existent, but the value is very apparent. So just playing raise, like small raise, even like well, yeah, click I mean, it, go four twenty five with the spade, jam without the spade. I think that's fine, and I also think like. It's, it's, another, it's an example of a spot where if you are up against bluffs, they are bluffs that have equity, right? Like if you- Flush draws. Yeah, exactly. Like there's you're, no flush draws. You're not running into any bluffs that you actively want them to 
be forced to continue with. Like, you're not you, going to see like queen jack suited. Exactly. Like there's no, when you have kings in particular, there's no bluff in their range that you're like crushing, right? You're crushing some value, but they're not folding that value. And I then feel. if they have a bluff, they have equity against kings. So you probably just want to ship it on the flop. I kind of like playing aggressive flop strategy where like if someone ever finds a way to fold the flush draw incorrectly, like you're just stealing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, I like that as well. And then like, because I, I, the way I've, I've heard it described is if you think about the, the EV that you gain and for every dollar that you put in the pot, if your opponent continues with a hand that has 40% equity, every dollar that you, you put in the pot, you're winning 60% of that dollar. But if your opponent continues with a hand that has only 20% equity, you're winning 80% of that dollar. So almost in, almost in every spot, the majority of your EV is going to be contributed by the times that you get your opponent to continue with hands that are actually definitively worse, not hands that are just like live but drawing, right? So when you get your opponent to call with a flush draw here or what, you get them to continue bluffing on the turn with a flush draw, you're benefiting some, but they're still very live, right? And in comparison to just getting it in on the flush draw, getting it in on the flop, uh, you're, you're probably not benefiting a lot. If they, if they had some bluffs in their range here, which were stone dead against kings, and you can get them to barrel the turn with queen jack of clubs then yeah absolutely just call <laughs> but that's probably pretty rare yeah. and in comparison to just being able to force them to get it in with tens jacks whatever spades they have whatever other random hands that they might be leading the flop with it, it just it's very meaningful to be able to get stacks in on the flop yeah, here. it's kind of a nice spot i think to jam just because there are call it eight cards in the deck when they have tens and jacks that are really annoying like a queen mm. over card bad probably gonna play some check bolts from them or like ace really bad um, so like it's harder to get value from the hands that you very clearly beat right and the bluffs don't really exist So the reason you'd flat is to keep the stuff in but they don't it's not going to be there as often as uh, Other spots. Yeah, so it's kind of a nice spot I think to just uh, like I think the reason why these flop strategies tend to play so passively is because they don't want the They don't want the confirmation bias to come through of I knew he had a set mm -hmm. Right, like they want the turn to be the seven of spades and then have it go check check and you know the river be a brick and then have it go check check and they just win yeah. versus queens yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've i've invested <laughs> enough money like i've won enough here right mm -hmm. versus right. i just very clearly win it all yeah they want the comfort that's the irony is like if you think if you think of that from a strategy standpoint you're always paying off the sets because you have an overpair in a very low spr like if you're a queen always, comes on the turn and you jams you still call yeah, you're just like always you're always paying off the sets so if you're always paying off the sets but then you're winning the minimum every time that you have a pair of repaired like you're absolutely getting torched here. Yeah. yeah. What the, it speaks to is the value of being greedy. Right? <coughs> like you have to, you have to take an approach where you want to make sure that when you have the best hand, you win the biggest pot that you can. Right. You don't, you don't want to just be satisfied to like, oh, I'm okay with winning a medium sized pot. Like, yeah. no, you want to win a big pot. You know. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. There are times in strategy where portions of your range will think that way of like, I don't want to bloat the pot anymore, but it's not because. You don't want to earn more money. It's not because uh, you you don't want to put any more money in the pot or in any like capacity. The value is not valuable enough. That's that's more of what it is. It's below the threshold of equity that can actually invest a lot more money into the pot, right? Like you'll just have hands that are winning versus some portion of their range, but that portion folds if you bet. And there's just no real reason to deny equity to the portion of the range that's basically drawing dead versus you while now giving up a bunch of EV versus the hands that are better than you that are calling. Yeah, yeah. this is kind of the <clears throat> tough part for people to play against polar ranges mm. where when you're crushing the bluffs, but you're crushed by the value and then you have like that weird in the middle spot of, oh, this guy three bet me from the big blind off this stack. I don't know what to do. I'm all in and you just fold out all the bluffs that you dominate and you get crushed by the overpairs that beat you. Surprisingly, it happens a lot with ace king. Ace king and ace queen, I think, are, are hands that fall into this category preflop. Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of situations where it's justified to call in position with these hands because you keep the bluffs in that you absolutely dominate. Right, and then when you flop an ace, like they actually put more money in the pot. Exactly, yeah. It happens in cash all the time. You know, like you open button and big line three bets, you get to just call ace king a lot. Should we, uh, should we take a look at what the straddle ranges pre look like just yeah. so that we can see a little bit of uh, yeah. what the approach looks like and, and give a, a bit of an idea of what we're three betting in this spot because I'd be pretty interested to see what kind of approach we have to take against under the gun. Yes, yeah, so this is under the gun open. I mean... This is eight-handed, eight six-handed? Seven. Seven, okay. Uh, 
Oh wait, no, it's because that's this the, is the under the gun straddle. So this is right, under the, the gun. The, the one before that's labeled straddle, so it's okay. Six, so it's, it's yeah, six handed. Yeah, okay, it's six handed. I don't think I don't think they have nine. They have eight. It's locked. Let's look at eight. It's locked for me. Why? Oh, okay. Give it. it give it. To me. Give me. One. I have the eight. I it to yeah, me. I have the eight. What the fuck's mm, going on the here? Eight. They're 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 jipping me out. They know I'm playing TT. It's not studying. Brutal, bro. Honestly, maybe I should. Some people in the studio sometimes put up the blind straddle on. Ren Lin said if uh, Lewis puts on a straddle, he'll put on a double. Mm. Maybe gotta get in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Undergun opens, cut off three bet, like we're playing no calls. Um, and that's simply because the machine, the parameters weren't built for it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not going to lose that much EV by playing three bet or fold anyways, because uh, having capped ranges behind is kind of hard. Uh, but it looks like we're just three betting. We even get the fold. To yeah, it's pretty tight. Um, you just kind of very high at the top left, like pseudo Broadway's good hands. Uh, even a strike off folding from just from <laughs> under the gun cut this off. Low, low jack. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Hijack cut off. Oh, hijack, hijack cut, cut off. Cut yeah, off but, right. Because there's no low jack because there's the straddle. Well, under, right. the, under the gun is, is low jack. Well, under, under the gun would normally be low jack, but because there's three blinds, it's hijack. Right. What am I missing? It's six handed. Right, but. No, 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 no. You're looking at it in reverse. The the under the gun one that you just pointed to is that's the that's under the gun that that's the lo hijack response against the three bet. Oh, I see. Yeah, this I do is, not know how to read wizard after all this time. <laughs> yeah, like, this is the, this, like this is the hijack response <laughs> after the three bet, correct? Uh, so we yeah, are we're just three betting like pretty. Well, this is pretty linear, I imagine, right? Like this is just top left. Yeah, it seems, grid, seems like know? just linear, high card, heavy, like a little bit of the Fantastic Four. Yeah, and, then. and that's about it. Uh -huh. And then Ace Four, Ace Five, King Nine suited, unblocking the offsuit tens. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of what the range looks like. And then small blind, like you can just send it in with kings. Like send it, send it in with kings. Yeah, you're just like ah, like an ace can come. Just eat it mm -hmm. in there. Ace King off, Queen Ace King <coughs> off, kind of big one, just like playing. Post is kind of weird at this SPR. Ace King off love. The thing is, is like all of these cold in. four bets are hands that people would notorious, notoriously cold call anyway. Like mm -hmm. it's not like the machine is saying fold the hands that you intuitively want to call. Mm -hmm. It's just saying don't fucking call them. Yeah. You know, it's like oh, you have king queen yeah. suited. That's fine. What, four bet it. What I think yeah. is interesting is if you look at some of the sims where they have the option in the tree to cold call. It's just that the sim doesn't take it. You can use the compare EV function to look at, like, if we did cold call, which hands would actually be losing the most or winning the most. Mm. And what you end up with is, if you, if you look at all the hands that fold, uh, the offsuit ace and king blockers and, and stuff like that, like, if you're going to be forced to play the hand, you want to cold four bet it and never call. But a lot of the, the middle suited stuff... Uh, like everything that's vaguely suited and connected and doesn't have an ace or a king in it, if you were forced to play the hand in some way, cold calling would be better than cold four betting. So yeah, you, that makes sense. You, uh, you can look at some spots and actually compare, like if we were, if we were definitively saying, I'm never going to want to fold this hand, you know, which hands prefer to cold, cold call and which hands prefer to four bet. And we basically just want to be cold calling stuff that, is is not as easily dominated by the three betting range which means it's going to be stuff that has middle cards stuff that has lower cards even and some pairs um so obviously that stuff is losing but if we did cold call we'd kind of want to have that type of range all right so what i'm trying to do here i'm just going to give a cutoff like the same range as like the theoretical theoretically correct straddle one and then mm -hmm. give the small blind uh the what we think a cold call range might look like sure so it's like eights plus, eights to queens, some suited Broadway sometimes. I don't know if he folds them. Who, who knows, you know? Uh, so something like this, this seems reasonable. Because some of these, maybe they four bet. They feel like they're trying to make a move. Sometimes they don't want to make a move, you know? Move. <laughs> sometimes you got to make moves. Yeah, make moves, man. Make some money moves. Um, <laughs> so 963, right? 963, uh, yep. yeah. that's right. 963, small blind. Yeah, they're not supposed to lead, uh, which is not surprising to anybody because cutoff has the, the better hands. Like, they have some good hands, but... Like, these hands are still worth a lot. Just because they're worth a lot doesn't mean you lead them. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, like... They're worth less if you just fold out the cutoffs to trash. He goes, like, mm -hmm. what? Like, 66 on the... He like, yeah. He went yeah. 200. Yeah, so 60. The old two-thirds pot lead. Put, put the money in the middle. <laughs> put the money in the pot right now. Uh, let's see. I just want to make it, like, look like somewhat... 
Okay, so like this range now, we see like a set is just gonna lead, queens are gonna mm -hmm. lead, like king queen, ace king off with the spade is gonna lead sometimes. Like I guess we can. Yeah, just... this is probably like not unreasonable. Not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable. Landon brought it way down because he still doesn't think ace king leads. So now, <laughs> so now, <laughs> now, he, now, he, now he has like, queen. It. Yeah, now he has queens leading like three percent of the time just to bring yeah. ace king down the half. <laughs> trying to sneak <laughs> manipulate it so he's right. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we caught him. Yeah. Uh, Got him. Like, what are we doing? Uh, <laughs> they lead. Your reactions to people playing hands bad are yeah. always entertaining. And then you have kings, rather. and you're just like, all right, like, I can click it up here. I think click it up is nice. Um, click it up. Click it up. Just a, just a little yeah, click no, back. And and, yeah, no and, surprise, and it's calling the ones with spades and raising the ones Because if they're bluffing with ace, with ace mm -hmm. king with a spade, and you have a king right. of spades, it's more likely. What, what are the... This, in this spot, it's always interesting to see what the the leading range is supposed to do after this because you get to some weird spots. After where call? Well, no, after we, if we click it back or if we jam because they're never... Jacks have to fall. Yeah, like they're supposed to do stuff that they're never going to do, yeah. right? They're Flush supposed to like... put it in. Like yeah, seconds like, put it in. They're su supposed yeah. to find weird folds that they can't actually Sometimes find. Ace and... King just goes all in on you. Just, like, <laughs> they're like, oh, like, you got King, Queen of Spades, like, right? I they're supposed to like... Moment lead eight if they lead eights they're supposed to like fold it to a click half the time like that's not happening okay. yeah so it's like kind of who who really knows uh anyways we call turn was what five of spades seven, seven of spades seven, seven of spades and then he's like oh like i'm all in now <laughs> yeah like that the, the fear of like the jam is like when you put in this much money you only get called by like flushes or hands that are good mm -hmm. like so like we just like click the button that doesn't exist if kings with spades, we're like, oh, like we're just winning like seven bigs. Like, the disdain in your voice <laughs> is so totally funny. Awful. Every time someone takes like a punty line, the disdain that you have for it is always How are so aces entertaining. with the ace of spades ever mixing? Because the issue is what's his bluff, right? Who cares? The machine cares. I mean, you're just drawing to the nuts. Yeah, but I guess the issue is you might see you set, but not really, you know? It doesn't sure. matter. Any gem for 2x pot in this makeshift non-believe spot because the SPR is actually going to be smaller than I put because someone cold called so I kind of fucked up three uh but long story short can't too good can't too good queens like no spade like you're kind of like mad but at the end of the day I think that's kind of where the line is but I would just raise flop to not have to deal with this I imagine like mm -hmm. play the play the raise and if, if you get cooler you get cooler that's where we're at I think that's where we're at. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's no real surprise. Don't fold kings. I don't think. Um, fold kings. But I, I, I will say, like, so, you know, why our users in the muck here is a lot of what I was trying to eliminate prior, which is how to navigate over pairs on dicey board textures where players are just too wide. And the fear tends to be that they... They somehow they, have it. Well, they do have it when they put a lot of money in. Like, the guy still had it. He just yeah. had worse. Right, like that's that's kind of the fear is that there's this convergence on all of their nothing just immediately surrendering, right? So like if somehow which is true, yeah, if somehow they peeled Ace Jack of Hearts there from the small blind, like not only does he never lead, but he never puts a penny in the pot. Yeah. It's check fold for sure. What's really interesting about this whole hand is both players, the line that they took all the way through was fear based right, right? like yeah, yeah. Wait, i mean except for the three bet pre with kings obviously fine sure cold call it's fear based because they don't want to fall bet they don't want to <clears throat> they don't want to face a jam they don't want to have to make a subsequent or even decision. just like only be up against kings and ace king right right whatever they get called they they so they cold call they go three ways to the flop they lead the flop because there's two spades and they don't want to they, they're afraid of seeing a third spade they get called the kings is only calling because they're afraid of running into a better hand then the turn comes to seven, Queen's jams because they're now afraid of seeing a fourth spade. Right. <laughs> even mm -hmm. though they were afraid of seeing a third spade. And they have with. the Queen of Spades, <laughs> yeah. so like the fear of it shouldn't even exactly, really be there. Right. I, I don't really know if they did. Queen's I put calls. them to oh, having it, see, but uh, he just mm -hmm. said they had Queen, so I'm not right. Right. Okay. 100 But it's sure. like two, two fear-based lines, and it eventually ends up with them getting all in anyway, mm -hmm. but they just were unhappy about it. Right, right. and the, the fear still converges them on the exact portions of range that they were fearful of to begin with. Yeah, and it, mm -hmm. the result is exactly what it should have been if both players had played perfectly pre. Right. Which is funny. Yeah. Um, if you guys find yourself in the muck, please submit to our forum. Head to Discord, uh, hashtag Discord in the chat, or at OnlyFriends underscore pod. It's our pinned tweet. You can follow the link there. We got a lot going on in the Discord channel. We have a bi-weekly uh, meetup every other Saturday led by the Not one twice only a week. Chi. 
uh, he will be on the upcoming season, season 11 of Poker Out Loud. So you guys will get to see one of our students in the mix. Does a great job of organizing and running these um, these biweekly study sessions. Uh, also, we're getting a little thin on in the mucks. You know, we're we're dipping into the multi way ones now. We yeah. uh, we need we need more we need in more. the mucks. Give me more, more, people more. In the muck. more, more, more small states. Tortoise more needs more. Tortoise. And I, listen, one option is not an option, right? Give me options. Yeah. <laughs> Tortoise is winning too much to be in the mark, so he he's disqualified. It's, I know. I just he needs someone else to come back. Uh, but yeah, I, I think like we can kind of button this up with. Um, you know, the overarching discussion of, of multiway is so much more about how to navigate your marginal value mm -hmm. and how different that marginal value is quantified compared to whenever your head's up. Yeah. Right. Like it almost goes up a level where like your top pair weak kickers is maybe where marginal value begins in a heads up pot, but now it becomes like your top pair of good kickers. And I guess like if, what would, what would be your, your general takeaway or your general advice to players who are just afraid of stacking off with this portion of range? Um, I would say just be extremely mindful of the SPR mm. because that, I think, is the biggest thing that people struggle to adapt to. Right. And in this case, it's, it's exactly the reason why the player ended up making a mistake, like not recognizing that SPR are three on the flop. Like, you're going to have to get it in a lot. <coughs> like, you're just... There's so many spots where SPR three, like, the best play is being all in, realizing your equity. Um, so I would... I would just encourage people to recognize that when you get to the flop with those low SPRs, you have to be comfortable being all in at a pretty high frequency. Right. And it's really, really tough to be in a situation where something happens that causes you to make a big fold. But conversely, if you go to the flop with a high SPR and you know, you're, you're six ways at 300 bigs deep and the flop SPR is 15, now you have to be really, really cautious and you definitely have to make sure that you're not putting in tons of money with one pair. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. What are the thresholds for... High SPR, low SPR, medium SPR. I don't know if you can categorize it because it's like it, it, they're just numbers. So like, what's the threshold for a high number? You know, like I, it's just. Well, I, I think there's a good. I think there's a general rule you can fall by, mm -hmm. uh, and that's when three E is pot or greater. Okay. Mm, okay. Uh, that that's the way I tend to look at it. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, this changes based off of uh, the action that's taking place. But when we're talking multi-way, it's it's almost not going to matter, mm -hmm. right? Like. If if three E is greater than hundred percent pot, whether it's a single raise pot, three bet pot, whatever, uh, you're at a deep SPR. Yeah. Right. So uh, let me pull up my little, my oh, you little got a template. Little, little template. I got a little cheat cheat sheet on See, my I know, phone. I know my two E's pretty well, but I don't know my Same. three E's that well. Same. Well, there's a little bit of a cheat for it. You can um, you can divide by two and bump back uh, a stage and usually get the three E. Oh, okay. So I think a good example of this is like. SPR four two E is uh, pot. pot. Yeah. Um. So three E there would be at an SPR of I think three and a half is half pot. Oh, okay. But let me let me double check that. And tell you for yep okay. three and a half three E is fifty percent four yeah. e, uh at four it's fifty five percent. Okay. So that's kind of like the little it just like steps one. Uh, whatever. Yeah. It's a little convoluted what no, I just said, I, but you I kinda, understand. I kind of get it. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So when you're looking at three E nearing pot, you're looking at an SPR of like fourteen. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's that's gonna be really yeah, high. Yeah. I was gonna say like fifteen plus is like definitely where I would consider it to be like this is really deep. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to give you to give you a, another round number at ten SPR, uh, three E is eighty eight percent. So okay. that's also like. Starting near, getting yeah. close to... Basically, 10 SPR yeah. plus, we're starting to look at uh, very difficult to be all in by the river. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That makes sense. Without, like, pretty strong calculations into your oh, sizes. We're being played out. I'm going to issue a correction to myself from earlier on. Go ahead. Uh, there's a reason I thought it was King of the Ring 1998 instead of Over the Edge. It's because King of the Ring 98 was the famous Hell in a Cell match, Undertaker uh, and Mankind. Mm. Everyone knows that. Even people who don't know wrestling know that because there was a meme about it. What right. That's and, what I was thinking of. Oh, is that where he comes out of the coffin? Uh, he Undertaker did that like 50 times. <laughs> oh, it's, when, like it's when Mick Foley fell through the ceiling of the cage ah. to, the, yeah. to the mat and like fucked himself up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, effectively, they were both part of the undead. Yes, Mick, so, Mick Foley know. has been for decades now. Like, <laughs> I can't believe he's still alive. Yeah. Props to Mick Foley. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for us today. We're going to be back tomorrow at noon Pacific. I believe we're going to get into this recent GG scandal. Uh, with, I think it's called OK Poker, the Russian affiliate. 
Um, no, the Russians, I'm going to dig into the homework the for that tonight. Uh, so we're either going to get to that as the lead tomorrow or on Friday. I'm really unsure. Um, but be sure to stay tuned. Noon Pacific, we'll be joined by Melissa Poo Dog Schubert in the building. Will we, though? Uh, Will we, though? She might sleep through our alarm. We'll see. We'll Sorry, see you guys slept through alarm. Peace. Hey.